let's talk about the DAS Audio Vantec 18A. This is an 18 inch powered subwoofer. We have four of these in inventory right now and I think we bought them pretty much right when the Vantec series was released. The specs on these are pretty good. Uh, they, you know, market it as a 2000 watt subwoofer cabinet. I'm not a huge, you know, I don't care what the watt rating is. I care about what the cabinet can do. So it puts out 134 dB of sound. In deep mode, it'll hit down to 30 hertz. In loud mode, it'll hit down to 35 hertz. And if you watched my Do Watts Matter video where I kind of went into what, what to look for with um, subwoofers, you got to remember at, you know, the 30 hertz and 35 hertz, that's a rating at negative 10 dB. And every 10 dB is roughly a doubling of sound, so you have to think, when it's hitting that 30 hertz, that's at half the volume of, you know, where the subwoofer peaks, I guess, or maybe, I assume it's where it peaks, so it's 10 dB down from that. So you've got to think that 30 hertz is pretty much inaudible when you're, when you're actually playing. So this is where looking at the frequency response chart really comes into play. And when you look at that, you can tell it hits right around 50, 60 hertz at its, you know, that's where the, it kind of ramps up and then kind of does a, a steep dive down after that. But right around 50, 60 hertz is really where, where the, the punch hits, which is kind of right where you want it to hit. So this has been one of our most popular rental subwoofers. Uh, I've had people rent our Dual 18 uh, Action 218A cabinets, and there that the peak on the frequency response is much higher. And it's not as popular with DJs, it doesn't seem to be as popular with bands. Even though this puts out less SPL, 134 compared to 140 on the Action 218A, people prefer having two, just two of these, two single 18s as opposed to two of the Action 218A. And I, I always say, uh, if you're buying a subwoofer, that's one thing that you really should spend money on. You know, if you go with a cheap sub, you are gonna get subpar performance. So go with a little bit more expensive sub and you'll get that deeper sound, that deeper, louder bass that, that everybody wants when you buy a subwoofer. So a subwoofer is not really something that you should skimp on. So if you're looking to buy a sub, I would definitely recommend this cabinet. You know, even if you can only afford one, to start off with, you know, add a second one down the road, but just just one will, will vastly improve your sound. And, you know, the cabinet is surprisingly lightweight. I've, I've been doing a lot of subwoofer research lately, and when you, when you find a cabinet from other manufacturers that does what this one does, you know, is equal output-wise to this one, you wind up with a cabinet usually around 90 pounds up to probably 110. And that's, that's going across multiple lines of, of manufacturers. This one comes in just under 80 pounds, so it's surprisingly light. But I will say it is a fairly large cabinet. You know, I used to have some QSC KW181s, and this is definitely a lot taller than the, than the KW181 was. Now, sound quality-wise, I'm not doing a comparison video, but I do think the sound quality coming out of this cabinet is a little bit better than the QSC KW181. And the main reason why I will say that is this is a newer cabinet. The QSC cabinet, you know, I think, I, I personally think it's due for an upgrade. I think... Uh, Maybe QSC just has a bunch bunch in inventory and they're waiting to sell through them before they come out with something new because they did come out with the K.2 series. I think the KW series needs a KW.2 and I, I think they could use a little bit of improvement in the sub. Now, I do always like to say the good with the bad. I, I do recommend the sub. I do think it's one of the best ones on the market right now. 
but there's a few things I don't like about it. Number one, this subwoofer, now I've had this problem with other speaker manufacturers before, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit, but this is one of the speakers where I've had two speakers where I thought they were blown. They came back off a of rental and you know, I either tested it out in the shop or I sent it out with one of my DJs and then got a phone call saying my sub doesn't work. And then when I go to push the, you know, usually I'll test if a driver is blown just by taking the grill off and applying a little bit of pressure to, to the speaker. And if, if it's locked hard, you know there's something wrong with it. If, if there's free movement, then you got to look at your amp. But I've had two where the driver's just been solidly locked. And coming off a rental, you don't know if somebody has just been, you know, running the thing like crazy and just completely blew it really hard. So at first I ordered a recone kit. And then, and so the first one, then I popped it out, took a knife, cut out the basket, and then found that the magnet inside had shifted. Which typically means that somebody, there was some kind of jarring impact. Now, I haven't seen any damage done to any of these cabinets, but it could be somebody just set it down too hard. My thought is maybe right after the gig, you know, they were driving the speakers pretty hard. You know, the, the speaker warmed up and maybe the glue got a little loose and then they moved them right away. I don't feel like that really should be an issue, but I recently had another one just yesterday. I cut, cut the cone out thought, well, I'll put my recone kit to work, pulled it out, another shifted magnet. And I don't know why the magnets keep shifting in them. You know, there are some videos on YouTube about how to fix a shifted magnet. That's a little, a little too, a little too much work for me. I don't mind reconing a speaker, but I'm definitely not going to pry off a, pry out a inner magnet and start shimming it in nicely and re-gluing it. I'll just buy a new driver if it comes to that. But a new driver for this, I think like 298 bucks, somewhere around there. So it's not, not cheap. It's a lot of money if this happens. And I've had it happen twice now, so I've invested 600 bucks into new drivers because of shifted magnets. I've also experienced a shifted magnet on one of the Action 12A speakers we have. And, you know, the thing that I thought with that was that... Um, when somebody went out and did a production gig, they stacked the speakers along the side and they didn't ratchet strap them. And one speaker did come falling down, you know, in route back to the shop here. And I think that jarring impact might have shifted the magnet in that one. But DAS isn't the only company I've had that issue with. I actually, one of the QSC KW181s, brand new out of the box, I actually had a shifted magnet and I called QSC and they just shipped me a driver for free to fix that one and when I when I talked to them on the phone they had assumed that somewhere in shipping you know somebody probably dropped a pallet some sort of jarring impact on one of the on one of the pallets as it was being shipped but um, you know shifted magnets aren't aren't unique to DAS Audio, so I, I wanted to kind of bring that up that I did have a QSC new out of the box with that issue. But I've got four of these and I've had two shifted magnets in two separate cabinets. So I'm starting to get, you know, a little iffy on whether or not, you know, DAS just has an issue with the glue they're using to, you know, get their, get their center magnet in there, in there. And I also wonder, when it comes to so there's like an outer magnet and an inner magnet, and it's the inner magnet, it just like, it shifts against the sidewall. So it's not blowing, but it's creating pressure on the cone that moves up and down to make it so it can't move. That's why it has that locked, solid feel. But I've often wondered, maybe a, maybe a speaker manufacturer, or you know, somebody that knows more about speakers could comment on this video and tell me, why, why is that center magnet glued? Why isn't it possible to have it bolted in place. Uh, you know, I don't know if it if it loses some of its magnetic properties, if it's just impossible to, to, to bolt the inner magnet down, but why is it glued? Because I seem to be having quite a few problems, and I'm not I'm not rough on our speakers. Well, although the, the subs, 
The subs were out on rental, so who knows what happened to those. The 12A fell down probably, I'm going to say from a height of about five feet to, you know, the floor of the trailer. But it's something I'm keeping an eye on because every summer I don't want to be constantly buying new drivers for these. You know, once, once you start buying a few drivers, you could pretty much just buy a new sub cabinet. So I'm very happy with this sub. I do recommend it. The output is good. I kind of wish it was 135 dB, you know, but 134 is okay. A lot of, a lot of single 18 nicer cabinets. The higher end ones are 135, but I don't think you really notice that lack of 1 dB. So 134 is not bad. Oh, there is one more quirk I'm going to mention. I'm not going to rotate it around, but if if you watched my Turbo Sound, uh, what is it? The IQ15B video or review. My main issue with that one was that there was no there wasn't a proper high pass filter for the outs. And that is one thing I do like about this. It does have a built in crossover, not only for the speaker cabinet, but a crossover that affects the outputs. So it doesn't matter what, what tops you use, whether or not they have a built in crossover or not. And that's what makes this great for our rental inventory. Somebody with a set of, you know, two 12 inch, two 15 inch speakers can rent this and know that if they take left and right, if they just rent one, they can go left and right into the sub, left and right out of the sub into their tops, engage the high pass filter in this and their tops are crossed over. I don't have to worry about whether or not their tops have a built in crossover, but I will say the one thing that I question about the design of this. So there's a variable high pass filter, but that variable high pass filter, I believe it goes from 80 to 120 and then hundred straight up is the center point, but 80 to 120, but that 80 to 120 only affects the subwoofer. I've, I've, I've read the manual probably a dozen times when I was first trying to figure out the whole variable crossover thing. And in the manual, it states that the built-in high pass filter for the tops or the, yeah, the built-in high pass filter for the tops is fixed at a hundred Hertz. And that's always made me question why the, the high pass filter for the tops would be fixed at a hundred Hertz but the low pass filter for the subwoofer would be variable between 80 and 120. Because if I, if I hook this up to 212s and the top speakers are producing everything 100 and up, you know, why would I want to run this all the way up at 120 or all the way down at 80? Wouldn't I want it to be crossed over properly at Subwoofers doing everything 100 hertz and below, tops doing everything 100 hertz and above. So that's one thing that's just always made me kind of question, you know, just, just the design around the, the crossover capabilities of this thing. I, I, don't, I don't understand the point. If, if somebody out there knows the point, you know, feel free to tell me because I have no idea. And maybe, maybe it's in case you have tops that have a built-in crossover at 120, you can crank this up to 120. But I'm just saying, why wouldn't you have the, the variable crossover affect the outputs as well? That, that, that part of it kind of mystifies me a little bit. And I, I'm always one for precision too, so I hate having a fixed output crossover at 100, and then I gotta try to get the knob at 100 because, you know, how, how accurate is that knob? If I got it accidentally, you know, say the notch is just right there. Am I really crossing it over at 95? That's, that's always one thing that kind of irritates me about this, but that's really the one, probably the one and only hiccup, you know, as far as the design, I will say, and, and why I question like why they would do that. Uh, 
I should also mention, it does have a pole socket here. I have the the Gator Hydraulic Air Assist pole that I, I use with this. And I don't know if it's the design of their pole socket or if it's the, just the Gator pole, but when I put the Gator pole in here and you know, I put a 12 inch speaker on it. There is so much wobbly play. I mean, it's, it's, it, frankly, it's ridiculous how much wobble there is in it. I mean, I, I've, I've had, you know, pole sockets where I've had just like, just a little bit of wobble, which isn't bad, but I mean, it's enough wobble to where when I'm not even extending the hydraulic pole, I can grab it and have it fall forward. And then I've got a nice downward tilt to the, <laughs> to the dance floor with the top. And I got to be careful that it's not like wobbly tilted back and shooting up at the ceiling. I mean, it's, it's surprisingly bad. So I do wish in future speakers, just because I feel like, I feel like the pole sockets are kind of becoming a thing of the past. I feel like every manufacturer should just switch to an M20 threaded pole socket for a nice secure pole that's solid and you know, isn't going to be wobbling all over the place. And I know in a lot of videos I've been bringing up the Yamaha um, DXS uh, 18 XLF, and I like how they do it. They ha they have a pole socket, and right behind it they have the threaded M20, so you've got both covered. And I will say I need to get more single 18 subs. I'm probably going to be buying at least two of the Yamaha ones to start out, just just to try them out because. The specs on those things are amazing. They they hit hit at about the same frequency of Ds, but they they're 136 dB of output. So they are uh, probably 25 pounds heavier per cabinet though. So I mean the the weight does kind of suck with them. You know, you're 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 for an extra 25 pounds you're getting 2 dB of SPL. So you kind of got to weigh the pros and the cons on that, but. I think, I think I'm gonna roll the dice and try two of them to, to, to see how they are and I might have to buy the casters to put on the backs of the Yamahas, you know, to, to wheel them around and hopefully, hopefully I can do a stacked lift one on top of the other by myself. That's kind of the criteria, but you know what, with subs, I was actually watching somebody else's sub review on, uh, on one of the Yamahas and, and the guy made a really good point. He said, "With with subwoofers, there's there's basically three points to look of, you know, you've got uh, what did he say? Price, weight, and performance. And I, I totally agree with that. Those those are kind of the, the the variables on it. If you get a really high performance sub, it's going to be a lot heavier. Even when you compare like the cheaper RCF subs to to the more." to the uh, higher end ones, like if you're looking at like the, the 8004, which is a single 18, I want to think that one, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, it's well over 100 pounds. But if you look at like their cheaper 18 inch sub, you know, you're, you're back down to about this 80, 90 pound range. So with subwoofers, if you're, if you're buying a nice sub, it's going to be heavy. And I will say this one kind of might be the odd exception that it's about 80 pounds and really it is a good sub. It, it hits nice and low and it's got pretty decent output at 134 dB. A lot of comparable subs in this weight range will top out at probably about 131, 132 dB. So getting 134 out of this and still hitting, you know, at negative 10 in the 30 to 35 range and being really punchy at that 50 to 60 range. This does have a good weight to performance ratio and price wise, I don't remember what they're at right now, but 1400, 1500 bucks a sub. You know, if you, a lot of times with a sub, you go up in price, you go up in performance, you go up in weight. And that's, that's just the way it is. So a lot of those, a lot of the single 18s, if they're, if they're a really good single 18, they're going to be around a hundred pounds. This is definitely one of the lighter ones in that range. But uh, if you have any questions about this sub, uh, go ahead and throw it down in the comments section. 
I've used these quite a bit. The the grills are dented in. The uh, there's there's gravel on the on the grills that won't go away. I've tried to wash it off. I will say the handles are nice. They've got a good rubbery feel to them. They do not have. Here's one thing I will say too. They do not have. I kind of like when there's like recessed pockets for where you know when you stack one on top of the other. There's like a little bit of recessed area where the feet can kind of lock in and you. You know, it might not fully lock it together, but you know it's gonna gonna help it stay there because these do get quite tall. If you stack two of these on there, they do get quite tall. Um, also, I should mention you can you can fly these. Uh, I obviously have never flown them, but uh, yeah. If you have any questions, throw it down in the comments section. Till next time, have a good day.